Okay, so during hydrogen fusion, when hydrogen is being fused to helium, there's this, this state of balance where the tremendous amount of energy that is, that is pushing outwards from basically a billion hydrogen bombs going off every second is balanced by the inward gravity of all the stuff that's there. Okay, so it's in a state of equilibrium where the outward pressure is exactly matched by the inward gravity. And when that happens, while it's fusing hydrogen, it's said to be in the main sequence. So main sequence basically just means the main lifetime of the star. Our star has a main sequence lifetime of about 9 or 10 billion years. So our star is about halfway through its life cycle. So here's a diagram. The core is here. It's fusing hydrogen. It's releasing tremendous amount of energy, which is pushing outwards. And the gravity from all the massive quantities of gas is pushing inwards. Now, when the hydrogen is mostly used up, uh, what happens is that the, the ability to, to fuse that hydrogen decreases, and so the fusion slows down and eventually uh, almost stops. And when it does, that, that equilibrium is thrown off. Excuse me. There's still gravity pulling in, but there's not as much force going out, so that the whole thing, the gravity tends to take over and squeeze more. And when it does that, it, it squeezes the core in, and that core squeezes in further and further and further. And when it does that, it actually starts to fusion, uh, the process of fusion again, but in this time it's fusing helium into carbon. So at first we were fusing hydrogen into helium, and now we're fusing helium into uh, into carbon. So that is that actually releases a heck of a lot more energy and uh, it, it really suddenly the, the energy output of the core goes way up and what happens is that means that the, the equilibrium goes the other way and uh, the, the pressure of the, the outward pressure from the core overcomes the inward pull of gravity and uh, it well it, it puffs up, it swells up. Like it's like, like putting more air into a balloon, it, it swells up even more, and that becomes a red giant star. And to put it into perspective, the radius of a red giant star, the, the whole star would be about the size of Earth's orbit. So it's much, much bigger than, than our sun. So what happens is, at that point, uh, we have the helium burning in the core, but then there's a little layer of hydrogen around the outside of that, which is also fusing. So it's kind of like a, a, a multi-layer core where there's helium fusion going on in the middle and hydrogen fusion going on around outside. And all of that produces tremendous energy, which is, which is puffing up this, this star. This whole thing becomes a red giant. Now, the red giant star is unstable. There's so much energy being released by that core that outer layers get thrown off. They just kind of get puffed off into space. And we saw some pictures of planetary nebula in, uh, in one of the previous slides, uh, previous presentations. And uh, that's basically those outer layers, those outer shells of the red giant star being tossed out into space. Eventually, all of that outer stuff gets tossed out into space, and all that's left is this, that tiny little core, and that tiny little core that's busy fusing helium into carbon and so on is called a white dwarf star. And that white dwarf star, billions and billions and billions of years later, will actually kind of cool down, and what's because it's producing carbon, what's left is a giant crystal of carbon, essentially. Uh, now, it's much, much denser than, than diamond, but essentially it would be like a, a super awesome dense diamond uh, left over. This is a planetary nebula. So this is that, those outer shells of gas that are being ejected, and right in the middle is the, the white dwarf that remains. And again, there's another one. This is called the ring nebula. So there's that outer shell of gas, and then right in the middle there, you can barely see it, is a, is a white dwarf. Now, little itty bitty stars, little teeny tiny, little itty bitty stars, uh, they just don't get very hot, they don't glow very brightly, and they're called red dwarfs. Now, the main sequence of red dwarf, because it's not very hot, it's not very massive, the f rate of fusion is very slow, and 
they stay in the main sequence for oh hundreds of billions of years. So 10 to 100 times longer than our sun, and then they simply <laughs> peter out. Now, I don't even know if the universe is old enough for one of these things to have petered out yet, so uh, I don't know that we'd ever find one if we went looking for it. Now, if it's really, really tiny and doesn't even have enough mass to start that fusion, then it's simply called a brown dwarf uh, or a failed star. It's a star that just never got going. Okay, so this is uh, an example of some sizes, so the size of our sun, uh, and then the red dwarf, uh, Gliese 229a, and then here's a brown dwarf, 229b, uh, and here's Jupiter for comparison. So a brown dwarf is, is really not much bigger than Jupiter. If we have a really, really big star, on the other hand, there's so much pressure and so much heat that the rate of fusion skyrockets and it it really burns through that that hydrogen enormously quickly and it produces super large super duper hot stars they go through their hydrogen so rapidly that they only stay on the main sequence for uh, for maybe a few million years it seems like a long time but compared to the 10 billion years or so of our sun it's it's a it's a blink of an eye they're being really loud out there I hope it's not coming up too much on the sound so when the hydrogen is used up, then it, again it goes through the, the whole process of burning helium, just like, um, like a medium-sized sun would, and uh, it, it puffs up to make a red giant. But then it also, like this becomes like a super-duper monster red giant. Um, and when this runs out of helium, it will start uh, going up the, the periodic table, right? So it'll start fusing heavier elements. So it'll start fusing uh, carbon once the helium runs low, and then it'll start fusing nitrogen once the carbon runs low, and it'll start fusing silicon once the, the, the nitrogen runs low. And then it will get to iron, and there's a problem in that iron doesn't release energy when it fuses. It actually sucks energy in. So suddenly like, there's more and more and more and more energy being produced in these cores, and then suddenly it gets to iron, and then it's like <laughs> And that's why it says, run because what's going to happen is the core instead of producing tremendous amounts of energy just starts sucking energy in and the whole core just collapses on itself and then it's it's like with these bug bunny, bugs bunny cartoons right where the, the the coyote runs off a cliff and kind of goes uh oh and then falls down that's what's happening in the core here right it's going out 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 pressure 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 and then it's just gone and it's like uh oh and the whole thing collapses and it just basically blows itself to pieces. Okay, now when it does that, the stuff in the core, like so there's this giant explosion, the stuff in the core basically gets compressed inward, so all of the nuclei of all of those things just get <laughs> crushed together. And that makes something called a neutron star, which is basically, imagine uh, an atomic nucleus, but the size of, I don't know, the size of Toronto. And it's, it's super duper massive, and that's called a neutron star. Okay, so um, about one cubic centimeter has a mass of 10 to the 11 kilograms, so 10 to the, that would be 100 billion kilograms uh, in a cubic centimeter of this stuff. That's how, that's how dense this is. Okay, so when this explosion occurs, the stuff in the core is, uh, is compressed downwards, so while the outer part is blown outwards, the stuff in the core is squeezed down to a point where all of the, uh, the, the nuclei of those atoms are actually crushed together to the point where essentially it becomes a, like a one giant atomic nucleus, or a, a ball of compressed neutrons. And uh, that, what, as that happens, uh, the stuff coming down on it uh, it can only compress so far, and so that one, it bounces back, and two, anything in there that can still fuse will fuse and will, will cause a ginormous nuclear explosion and blows things out into space, and, and that's called a type 2 supernova. And you've probably heard the term supernova, and it's, it's an exploding, dying star. The amount of energy released is... Inconceivable. Uh, the, the type 2 supernova is so bright 
that it will outshine an entire galaxy. So it will outshine a hundred billion other stars. So we can see in, when, a, when a supernova occurs in a distant galaxy, we can see what effectively looks like a, a new star appearing that is brighter than all of the rest of the galaxy combined. And it can be brighter for, uh, for, for weeks or months even. Because of all of this compression and, and squeezing and fusion that goes on, that's the only way that any elements heavier than iron can actually form in the universe. So anything, anything heavier than iron is manufactured in a supernova explosion. So the iron in your blood came from a supernova. The gold in my ring came from a supernova. Any element heavier than iron, the only place it can come from is a, is a supernova. And that's, that's kind of cool when you think about it. Okay, so here's a photograph. Uh, this is kind of before and after. Um, this is in uh, so December 2004 and then March 2005. It's the same field of view. We have these same stars. And you'll notice that here there is a star that just does not show up here at all. Right? And so that is a supernova that's appearing in, the, in a distant galaxy. I think A actually is a, is a galaxy. So that's sort of the core of a galaxy that's too faint to be seen, but then this thing lights up and it's actually brighter than the entire galaxy. And this was a, a supernova that occurred in 1987 in one of the small satellite galaxies of Milky Way uh, called uh, the Magellanic Clouds. And so this was the star before it blew up and this is the star uh, after it blew up. So, we've seen that if the, the, the core can collapse and form this thing called a neutron star, but if the, the star is even heavier, when that core collapses, the gravity is so strong that even that compressed ball of neutrons can collapse further, and then there's really nothing that can stop it, and it just keeps collapsing in on itself, and it forms a ball so dense and so compact that the gravity around it is so strong that not even light can escape, and that's called a black hole. So even though the gravity near the black hole is, is outrageously high, uh, at, at a far distance, the gravity is no stronger than it is for a normal star. So uh, in science fiction movies, they often depict these black holes as like cosmic vacuum cleaners sucking things in from a great distance. But in fact, that's not the case. If our sun were to suddenly just be replaced with a black hole of the same mass and the same gravity, we would remain in exactly the same orbit. So the, the, it's not the amount of gravity so much as, as kind of the concentration of gravity. And uh, if you have a big object, then the gravity is kind of spread out. If all of that mass is compressed into something very, very tiny, then that gravity is very concentrated and that's when you get a black hole. Okay, double and multiple stars. We saw that previously that, that most stars are formed in uh, a, a cluster, in an open cluster, and as a result, when the, 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 those clusters break up, often the stars are gravitationally bound to another star. So after they break up, a bunch of the, uh, the stars remain as double stars or as, as triple stars. Um, there's an activity here, and, and it's, it's in the links, where you can simulate uh, multiple stars orbiting around each other. But when we look out into space, a lot of the stars that we see are uh, double stars or, or multiple stars, which is kind of cool. Um, a little link to some Canadiana. The first black hole that was confirmed is one called Cygnus X1 and it was actually memorialized in a rush song but that was discovered because there was a, a large star that was seen to be orbiting something like a binary so the binary stars orbit each other like this right so that they orbit around each other and Cygnus X1 was that there was this large star that was orbiting around something that wasn't there and that was really the first evidence. So there must have been something in there that was massive with lots of gravity 
that could orbit, but we couldn't see. And so really that was the first evidence of a, of a black hole. And that was actually detected at the David Dunlap Observatory in, uh, in Richmond Hill. This is an artist's impression of a black hole and a star orbiting around it. And so the stuff is being kind of stripped off of that star and, and spiraling into the, the black hole. This is just a summary of the life cycle of stars. So for an average sized star like our sun, it will puff up eventually into a red giant. It will shed those outer layers as a, as a planetary nebula and then become a white dwarf. Whereas really big stars will puff up into a supergiant uh, as they go through all those different stages of uh, a fusion moving up through the periodic table. When they start to fuse iron, that core collapses, everything collapses inwards, and it goes through a ginormous explosion called a supernova, and then the results will either be a neutron star or a black hole. 